Emma, you want to go ahead and kick us off? Let's pull up the poll questions, first of all. And we've got uh, two questions on the poll. Um, the very first one, and, and um, keep in mind, folks, that these polls are designed to uh, get you in the mindset of uh, what we're going to be talking about. And so the first question is, how historically accurate do you think religious historical origins are on a scale from one not really accurate to five extremely accurate? And obviously the answers are one through five. And then the uh, second question is, which religion did you grow up with? And um, the main ones are on here, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, other, and no religious tradition. So uh, remember, these are anonymous. Um, we won't be able to see how you answer. Um, we're just kind of uh, interested in what the mixture of the room is. Um, so we've got the polls done. Um, what do you think about RFRX? What is this, um, Amaya? Yes, so for those of you who are new here, um, RFRX is basically a series of online weekly sessions where we bring in guests to discuss different topics that are relevant to anyone who is either living religion or has already left religion. Um, this is just a good way of providing good advice and skills in order to deal with um, any problems that you may have related to religion. And it's also a good way of providing some good information like the one we are going to have today. If you want to watch any of our previous RFRX sessions, you can go to our YouTube channel, and that is youtube.com slash recoveringfromreligion. This one will also be um, uploaded to that YouTube channel, so you will be able to watch it later. And if you want to send us any sort of feedback, any questions, any suggestions for people or topics, we do have an email address that you can write us to, and that is rfrx at recoveringfromreligion.org. So that is um, what we do in RFRX, but obviously RFRX is part of a bigger organization that, that is called Recovering From Religion. And in Recovering From Religion, we offer many different services and our mission statement is that we offer hope, healing and support to those who are struggling with issues of religion and non-belief. So the first thing that we offer is healing. And the way that we offer healing is via our helpline. So basically we have set up a helpline where you can chat with or call agents and um, these agents are trained to be able to listen to you and offer you an empathetic ear and no, no judgment or criticism to any issue that you may have. It's um, safe, completely confidential and available 24 seven. So if you feel like you could use just someone trying to understand your problems and just listening to you, I highly encourage you to contact one of our helpline agents. They are absolutely amazingly wonderfully trained and they will be able to help you. And then the other part of the, the way we offer healing is via our resource page. So we have gathered a very large number of resources in which, um, and that includes like articles, podcasts, videos, anything you can imagine, you will find it there. And it's just basically divided by different topics and also different religions. So if you want to learn more about the fear of hell, we have specific articles, books, videos, everything about that topic. If you want to learn more about Christianity, we have um, certain resources targeted towards specific religions. So it's just a different approach to healing instead of a personal touch, it's more of a resource based, based um, sort of thing. So that's healing. Now, if you want to explain hope and support, please. You bet I do. Folks, you know, we go through this every single week and it may be kind of like tiring to you, but the unique thing is like, if you hear us or you hear us talking about something and all of a sudden you're like, hey, I could use that. Then that's why we keep talking about this. That's why we do this whole beginning thing is to let you know and just to be, let you know what RFR can do for you. And one of those things is hope, like Amai had mentioned. And we kind of um, provide hope by the sharing and listening to personal stories. We're all in this together. We've all gone through our own struggles. Um, some of us, um, many of us may have similar experiences. And so if I can tell a story, like this is how I got out of religion. This is what I experienced when I was um, going through my existential crisis. If I can share that with somebody and somebody can hear that, it can provide hope. It can um, possibly give them a light at the end of the tunnel. And so we do that in two ways, through our blog and through our podcast. You can check out our blog at uh, medium.com slash excommunications, which is a fantastic name. And then um, we've got our blog and we'll have a links in the chat and in the description of this video as well. 
Now, support. Oh my gosh, support. Okay, I am the support group director, but I'm not biased at all. The support side of RFR is the best. It's <laughs> not really, it, it's all works really well together. We all just a great, great team of people. Um, if you're looking for someone or a group of people to talk to, then that is what the support groups are. This is where we have face-to-face -face meetings. Right now they're all virtual, but uh, soon uh, we'll get them back into, some of them back into in-person meetings. We'll just meet geographically somewhere. And we've got over 60 groups around the world right now. And this is where like the long-term healing, the long-term kind of work can uh, come into play where um, we just, it's a group of peers working together, talking together, listening empathetically, and it's fantastic. I've been um, a, a support group leader for five or six years, six years in Springfield, Missouri. And I don't know if I was ready to be a leader at the time, but I did it and it was awesome for me. But anyways, uh, you can find all of that stuff on our website or um, meetup.com slash recovering from religion. Now we talked about the helpline. We also talked about the support groups just now. Those are both peer supports. Nobody is a professionally trained to diagnose or give advice or anything like that. More, sometimes we're going to need more help than what peer support can offer. And we have set up, RFR has set up the Secular Therapy Project. And it's a directory where us like clients, you and I, we can reach out and find local therapists or therapists within our state or within our region um, who have been vetted by some fantastic people, expert people, people way smarter than myself, uh, to make sure that they are properly licensed, to make sure that they run a secular practice so you won't run the risk of being proselytized to, and to make sure that they run uh, an evidence-based practice as well. So you can find those folks get sign up for an account and find a therapist near you at seculartherapy.org. All right. I've been yammering for a while, Amaya. What else do you want to talk about? Uh, yeah, I also wanted to mention that we have another service called the online community. And the online community is basically um, an online platform where you can meet people that share similar backgrounds as you. So we have divided the online community in different groups. So for example, we have a group for people from the LGBTQ plus community. We have a, a group for Australians, for black non-believers, for um, the specific religions. So if you feel like instead of a professional counseling or instead of like a objective listener, like it is in the case of the helpline agents, you just want someone that um, knows what you're going through because they have gone through exactly the same thing as you. I would encourage you to join one of these, one of these groups. And all you need to do to join our online community is um, either chat with or call one of our helpline agents and they will let you know how to join them. We do have a um, certain um, like criteria that you need to um, complete in order to join them. So for example, I think we have an age limit of 16 or 14. I, I never remember the exact age, but yeah, as, as long as you meet the criteria, you will be welcome to join one of these groups. And I know it really, really does help people. And not only do, can you chat with the people in the online community, but they also hold sometimes Zoom meetings. So it's also just a great way of meeting new people and just creating, creating a sense of community, um, which especially after living very journey can be quite difficult. So there is that. And then I also wanted to give a shout out to um, the Atheist community of Discord because they are streaming this in their platform. So thank you guys so much in the ACD community. It's so amazing that you guys are um, streaming it and you do it every week. So thank you. And before we jump to the actual session, I also wanted to talk about volunteering because recovering from religion is exclusively run by volunteers. So um, every single one of us, uh, including the speaker, are doing it just for the joy of it, just because we believe in the cause. So we are always looking for new volunteers. And if this is a cause that you feel compelled to follow, if this is something that you feel like you want to help other people in, I do encourage you to join us as a volunteer. We have so many different roles. You could be a helpline agent, you could be a support group uh, leader like Eric, you could be um, a web developer if you're not so much into the human connection but more of the technical side. We have all sorts of different roles and I'm sure we would be able to find one for you and your skill set. So if you want to help other people, if you want to develop your skill set, I highly encourage you guys to join our, our volunteering team which if you do want to do, all you need to do is go to our volunteering page and that is recoveringfromreligion.org slash volunteer. 
And now, uh, Eric, do you want to explain the meeting format before we introduce our amazing guest of today? You bet I do. Folks, like every week, we have a very typical meeting format. We've got a discussion about our topic for about an hour. And during that discussion, you're probably going to have some questions, especially about this topic. So don't hesitate to ask them. Uh, type them into the chat. You don't need to raise your hand or anything. Type them in the chat. Either send them to us privately or just put them publicly in the chat. And that goes for you, Atheist Community of Discord. We're monitoring that as well. And if you've got some questions, pop them in there. You can go ahead and tag myself or Amaya. Um, once we have this discussion and it's been wrapped up, we will have a Q&A session. And that's where your questions are going to come in. We'll go ahead and we'll be collecting those throughout and we'll be asking those questions uh, during the session. After that, we're going to hear from our lovely and fantastic executive director, Gail Jordan, as she kind of closes us out with some thoughts. Then after that, we're going to shut off the recording. We're going to open up the lines and let folks uh, kind of hang out. This is a social hangout, and it's been incredibly popular. And uh, David has agreed to kind of stick around. And so you may be able to ask him some questions, uh, just kind of follow up. But anyways, it's uh, that's going to be how it works. So uh, we have, normally, it's either Maya or I introduce uh, the guests, but we have a very special person who wants to introduce Dave Fitzgerald. So uh, Dr. Ray, you're up. Thanks, Eric and Maya. I'm very happy to be able to uh, introduce the one person on this planet that's more perverted than I am. And, and we have evidence for that because he used to do, I don't know if he still does it, the Godless Pervert Story Hour in San Francisco uh, about once a month. Do you still do that, David? No, I, I think uh, Greta Christina and company still do it, but I'm actually oh, not in San Francisco okay. anymore. I'm, I'm oh, lived up the... That's, yeah. that's right. Well, anyway, uh, it's rare to find somebody that's more perverted than me, so I'm always happy <laughs> to, to find somebody. Uh, David, I, I first got acquainted with David uh, through his book, Nailed, and I read that book. I thought, this is great, uh, really amazing uh, insights into how, <laughs> how uh, you know, whether it's Jesus. I'd never even really thought about the historicity issue until I read that book. So anyway, somehow we got connected. I spent a great afternoon with David walking the beach out in, uh, in the Bay Area a few years back. And he invited me to come and speak that night to an evangelical young leaders group. I will never forgive him for that, by the <laughs> way. I, I have never spoken to a bunch of evangelicals in my life. And David gets me to speak in front of this group. And it was an interesting experience when I asked them, how many of you masturbate? And nobody raised their hand. And there wasn't anybody above 22 years old in there. So I'm pretty sure we had a few liars. Anyway, you, David, David. And then David did something really sneaky. Uh, a year or two ago, he sent me a manuscript. He said, would you mind reading my manuscript? Would you see, be interested in looking at and reviewing it? I said, sure, I'd be glad to. So I get this manuscript. Uh, it was an e-book. So I'm just reading it and 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 reading it. After about three or four days, I thought, this is taking a long time to read this book. So I look at how many pages the damn thing has, and it's like seven or 800 pages long. I had no idea. He snuck that in there. I thought, oh, a couple hundred pages. Well, and then after I read it, I tell him this is the most amazing book. It was Jesus Missing in Action. I thought, this is a great book. I loved it. I couldn't put it down, even though it was goddess long. <laughs> and then he says, oh, we're thinking about big in three books. And you didn't tell me this? <laughs> so I'm just telling you. This was such a compelling read. I read all three of these books and didn't even know I did it. So anyway, I just, uh, I want to say, Dave, this is great to have you here today. And I'm really, I'm really glad you agreed to, to talk with us. So I'll leave, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Dr. Ray. That was a great introduction, much better than uh, I could have done. But David, welcome. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm so overjoyed to be here. Thanks everybody for coming out. Yeah, um, I, uh, from what I understand, we can't believe that you haven't been on RFRX before. And so yeah. this is a perfect time and a great topic. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the founder figures of various religions and 
uh, I'll start talking about Christianity for starters, since that's most of our default and that's certainly my default religion. And then we'll expand from there. And uh, yeah, and open it up for a Q and A, but. Um, well, that sounds great. Um, David, were you ever religious yourself? Super religious. Yeah, I was actually raised Southern Baptist, the, the one true faith. And I was very <laughs> religious all the way up into college. And um, it's funny because uh, I don't know if we have time for me to get into the whole deconversion story. I know, I think Daryl's heard it before. Uh, but basically, um, it was a theological argument with, while flirting with a girl that deconverted <laughs> me. Uh, because, uh, and maybe we can get into that in the, in the, the, the after party. Uh, no, I, I, I want to hear this. YouTube right, sure well, as heck wants to hear this. So, <laughs> so the, the girl I was flirting with was a hippie, liberal, unchristian. And um, we, the way we'd flirt with each other is we'd have theological arguments with each other. And so one day we're going at it and she says, well, Dave, you know, the Hindu religion is like 3000 years older than Christianity. And I was all set to jump down her case. And I stopped. And before I could say, no, 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 it's not. I realized, you know what? I had no idea if Hinduism was older than Christianity or not. And I was getting ready to assert something that I didn't know was true or not. And that realization, that moment, that split second, I went from being a Christian to realizing I'm just like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons I'm always bagging on. I'm uh -huh. just parroting what I was told. And I'd like, I know people who had drawn out deconversions, but I can remember the millisecond I was a Christian to the millisecond was, my God, what have I done? Am I right or am I wrong? And from that <laughs> moment, it never felt real again. And I, I just kind of walked around in days and it was gone. It never looked anything but fake after that to me. Uh, wow. Did you just make a Talking Heads reference? I certainly did. I mean, I swear I had a little uh, <laughs> David Byrne on my shoulder doing the song, you know, am I right or am I wrong? My God, what have I done? Because I had never stopped to ask myself that question. I'd been raised a Southern Baptist. I was saved. I love Jesus with all my heart, blah, 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 blah. But I had never asked, oh, is this true or not? And once I asked that question, wow, it did not feel, look, smell true ever again it was the strangest thing that is one of the most unusual ways i've heard of deconversion like people usually take a few months yeah. if not years to deconvert but wow the fact that someone could just like change your mindset like that that's amazing it wasn't, it wasn't even like changing my mind it was just it was like this bolt from the blue hit me it was like a secular epiphany um it's like i lost my virginity and i just couldn't get it back you know it was gone yeah. um yeah, it was a very strange feeling, strange and wonderful. Um, and for like the first year or so, I was kind of in a daze thinking, well, what's keeping me safe? Where's my magical shield of protection that's kept me safe from all harm with a prayer? It's a, and a, a, it felt like I was in an airplane and the bottom had dropped out. And for some reason I was still flying. That was the, the analogy that kept springing to my mind. Yeah, yeah no, that makes complete sense. And do you feel like maybe that sort of sparked your interest in wanting to know more about the origins of other religions? Because I know we're going to cover Christianity, but not just Christianity. We're going to cover more than that. So. Good segue, good segue. But no, it didn't really. So one thing that really did strike me is that I suddenly had a much Christ-like uh, concern for people more than I ever did as a Christian. Because as a Christian, everyone was either saved or none saved, saved, unsaved. You know, it's like the Terminator going around late and saved, unsaved, saved, unsaved. And suddenly it's like, I could just let all that go. And just people would, could be people. And, you know, we have so much more in common with each other. Um, I felt so much more at home in the universe than I ever had before as a Christian. It was very, very strange. That's, oh, that's uh, I, I love that, um, you know, I kind of, I, I didn't deconvert because of it, but there was a girl that the way we flirted, she was Mormon, I was Christian. And I'm like, oh, you're totally wrong. But I didn't get to where you were and I, should, I wish I had. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the talk tonight is about, um, are your religious founders real? Um, where would we start with this conversation? Well, you know, 20 years ago, I had been an atheist for 16 years, totally happy. Um, 
I was fine with the thought that there was a Jesus. It never crossed my mind to question if there had been a Jesus. And I had read a book that I still love today. It's called Kin's Guide to the Bible. And it's sort of like, if you've ever seen the website Skeptics Annotated Bible, this is like the grandfather of that. Yeah. You know? what, what, did, what was it called? Uh, Ken's Guide to the Bible. Ken. Okay, like Ken and Barbie. Ken Smith. And Ken is an expert authority from the book cover. Um, and it was a really funny book. He just basically went through the whole Bible and pointed out all the funny things in it. But one of the things that struck me when I read it was how different Jesus is from gospel to gospel. And even though he meant it just having fun with the thought, it really struck a chord with me. I thought, well, yeah, and here Jesus is like a communist. Over here, he's like, you know, a, a food addict. You know, he's a, uh, over here, he's anti-Semitic. Over here, he's totally Jewish. It's like, and I got curious, who was the real Jesus uh, in all these four competing gospels? And was there a way to parse out the real Jesus from the legendary Jesus? Because, um, again, of course, I knew he wasn't the son of God, but surely there was a guy named Jesus. I mean, like I said, it never crossed my mind to think otherwise. Long story short, very short from that, about two years after that, looking, I was seriously seeing, trying to sort out the legendary parts of Jesus from the real parts of Jesus. Um, two years into that, I was beginning to think, okay, I don't think this guy existed at all. And realizing that, oh, I'm not the first person to reach that conclusion. And in fact, a growing number of people have started embracing that conclusion over the last 30 years. Um, and uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I can say a lot more about that, um, but just to, to avoid going down that rabbit hole, again, long story, very short, um, eventually I wrote a book called Nailed, 10 Christian Myths That Show Jesus Never Existed at All. And I don't mean any hyperbole in that. I'm not being clever or provocative or cute. I really think he did not exist at all. And when you look at the official story of Jesus, I listed out the top 10 ways that it just fails. Whether there was a Jesus or not, whether Christianity is true or not, these things that the Christianity says about Jesus were just not true. Um, and at the end of the book, the last chapter, second to the last chapter was called, Can Jesus Be Saved? And I listed out all the different ways that Christianity, the Bible, and early Christian history would be different even if there was just a guy named Jesus, as opposed to a legendary figure that was being preached at that time. Um, and the funny thing about that was, you know, I didn't expect the Christians to like that book, but I really didn't expect the blowback I got from our fellow atheists when I said in 2010 that Jesus never existed at all. Um, all these people uh, would get back to me saying, oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's crazy. That's pseudoscience. That's pseudo history. And they lumped it in with Holocaust denial and a moon landing fakery. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I, and that really, that was probably my biggest surprise at the time then. So it became really clear I was going to have to write a second book. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what became Jesus Missing in Action. And that was the answer, the respondent to atheist objections to the book. And in Nailed, I just talk about the top 10 ways that the official story of Christianity fails, how it doesn't pass water. But I didn't talk about where I thought Christianity really came from. And by me, none of this is my opinion. It's the secular scholars who have questioned Christianity. I wanted to bring that out into the open uh, in a way that hadn't been done before. Um, and so in Jesus, Mything in Action, I talk about where it looks like Christianity actually came from and all the problems we have um, with our sources for Jesus's biographical information for the New Testament and the New Testament epistles and evidence for Jesus outside the Bible and how this all comes together to really throw doubt on Jesus. Well, from we talk, you're talking about like the origin of Christianity, and um, but it seems more specifically, you're asking if like Jesus is real or not. Because from what I understood, uh, Christianity really kind of is just a, a cherry picking of Judaism, plus a little bit additional mythology um, uh, or, or uh, uh, letters and beliefs behind uh, added to it. It's certainly well. I mean, anytime you say anything general about early Christianity, you're probably mistaken. Hmm. But 
that said, um, the more we look at Christianity, the more there is to it. it. And it's going off in different directions. And it looks less and less like what we would call Christianity. Um, to the point where they, I like to talk about Christianities, not Christianity, because it certainly didn't start with a single founder. It didn't start in a single area. And it looks like it spun out of uh, Judaism at a time when Judaism was as fractured as it's more fractured than it's ever been in the early first. Century. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and in a nutshell, it looks like uh, if you take the Hellenistic mystery phase, that was the major religious movement in that time from the time of Alexander the great up until the Roman era, that was the biggest new sexy idea in religion was the idea of a personal savior God. And what they would do is they would take, you know, um, different cultures that they came under the Alexander the Great's empire, like Persia, like Phrygia, like Thracia, uh, Egypt, uh, all these different ancient cultures. And they would take their gods and turn them into a savior god, a personal savior god. So you, we have ancient writings about people talking about Isis, about her living in their hearts and how they've been born anew and the, the, the pastor who um, got, saved them is now their father and that kind of thing. Um, talking about these pagan gods, much like how we talk about our personal savior, Jesus. And so much to the fact that it looks like Jesus and Christianity is just a Jewish version of these rebooted savior gods. Uh, that's an awful long way to answer a short question shortly. Um, <laughs> no, but it makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, so would they take like gods from uh, like maybe Egyptians and Greek gods? Or yeah. do you mean like, oh, really? And say like, yeah. Zeus is my personal savior kind of right. thing. Well, well, they would say that for Isis, for instance. Uh, Isis was one of the savior gods. Uh, Mithra uh, in um, Asia Minor was uh, one of theirs. And they would all have a, like a cult around them. Usually they're very secretive. And so there's not any like handbooks of them. And, but what we do know about them is enough to know that they had like baptisms. They had Lord or lady suppers, um, uh, these communal meals. Um, and everything they do, they talk about their savior sounds exactly like Jesus fits in that mold. Um, and there's even parts of the gospels where it sounds like that they are explicitly saying that. In the beginning of Mark's gospel, uh, Mark 4.11, he has Jesus say something really incredible. He has, he's talking to his disciples and says, now I'm teaching in parables, uh, but I'm gonna tell you what these parables mean. I teach in parables because otherwise people who are, aren't uh, in our group, they would turn from their sins and be saved. And it's like, what? What, what are you saying here, Jesus? You know, that's still in our Bibles. And it's like, he, he's describing this is a mystery faith. And everything in that first gospel seems to be a parable, an allegory for this mystery faith. Um, can, can we um, go back a little bit? Uh, you had mentioned like many of these gods had their own cult around them and for us here in the 21st century um the word cult kind of uh, has this idea of like a compound and there's a ton of sex and there's this leader who um well, they often abuse like mentally and physically the followers and uh, super controlling um yeah. it, but it, it sounds like you're not quite describing that well, yeah, and I don't mean it in the pejorative sense, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, what I mean is these are religions, they were called mystery faiths in, you know, historiographical terms. Um, these are small religions that weren't out proselytizing to everybody. They were like small little cliques, like water buffalo lodges. Uh, like, um, oh, oh, okay. You know? Yeah, where like, you have like mason mystery. lodges or something like that, yeah, like Masonic mason. lodges. Not, yeah, not quite that level of Illuminati or anything like that. But yeah, they, they were small uh, deals. And in Rome today, behind, underneath almost every single church or cathedral, as far as you're going back, you can find a temple to Mithraism below it. It's, it's really remarkable. Um, and we, uh, we have, 
yeah, mm-hmm. for these things all over the Roman Empire and the, the Greek Empire before that. Before Myth- Greek Mithris, mysticism or Mithraism? Well, we're talking about, yeah, Mithra, Mithril, blah, 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 sorry, Mithra had a religion that's called Mithris, Mithraism. And is, we're talking about Jesus Mythicism. Is Mithra uh, a place? Mithra is a person. Mithra, oh, Mithra oh, oh. <laughs> a, I'm so um, sorry. I was thinking like the, the Middle Earth metal that they made right, mail out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it okay, uh, so Mithra is a person, and then there was a cult Mithra. surrounding yeah. Mithra. Mithra. Okay. All right. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can so, just you can just go ahead and pretend like I'm an idiot and explain no, it to no, me that no, way. No, no, it's totally okay. <laughs> there's so much to unpack in here. I'm trying very desperately to keep it small, but there's rabbit holes at everything I say. Every word it could go off in another direction. Got it. Um, so, uh, so here's the thing. When once, once um, <clears throat> the I wrote nailed and got all, all this response, the thing that surprised me the most of all was that how many Buddhists came up to me and said, yeah, we're having our same discussions in our circles about Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, was he real or not? And how many ex-Muslims came up to me and said, yeah, we're having the same debates in our circle on whether Muhammad existed or not. Oh, really? And that blew my mind. What? Because Muhammad is like sixth century, seventh century. Yeah. It's like, you know, they had writing then. We had, you know, gunpowder almost in, 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 during the Islamic empire. Um, and yet, you know, 1500 years ago, um, when they started to saying, yeah, because of this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason, I went, oh, wow, this is starting to sound a lot like Jesus. Um, so yeah, anyway, I, I've, I've, I've always kind of assumed that Jesus was either uh, the mythist mythic person or a mixture of people or maybe just one crazy rabbi but muhammad was real uh, right. buddha was real like i always kind of assumed those things or yeah. uh, i don't know about assume but I've, I've heard different stories and deep dives onto some of these characters yeah it, and it's funny because buddha i could see it because you know it, there's a lot of legendary stuff but but muhammad we've got so many we've got family trees for him we've got you know he's our came from Mecca and Medina and these are real places and like all this stuff. And it's like, how do you even start questioning that until they told me why they started questioning that? And it's like, Oh, um, and I've got some notes here because I just want to make sure I've got this right. So um, for the first 50 to 60 years of Islam, um, everything that we have evidence for completely contradicts the things that traditional Islam tells us. Uh, And for instance, we don't hear about Muhammad specifically linked as a prophet of Islam until 60 years after his death. Um, That that sounds very familiar to the Christian tradition too. Like the first gospels were the same time frame as well. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Like the first gospels weren't written until decades, maybe like 40. Yeah. Our very first gospel was Mark's, was written in response to the Roman uh, war in, Ju- in Judea and the destruction of the temple in the 70s of the first century. Um, yeah, that's, that's 40 years from the death of, of Jesus, if there was such a guy, easy. Um, and all the other gospels that followed Mark came even further. John and Luke were clearly written in the second century. Um, and there's, there's are you? Oh, they were written 200 years after. No, 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 oh, no, oh, no, 100. I, my math is yeah, off within, within yeah, that yeah. second century. Sorry, okay. or that early second century, but okay. still, yeah, um, yeah, well into well past the time that you'd have eyewitnesses. Not that any of the gospel writers were eyewitnesses. Um, well, and we're kind of um, jumping around a little bit. Let's kind of yeah. start with um, can, can we talk about Moses, maybe like one of the. Um, characters, uh, main characters in Judaism. Um, yeah. And I don't mean to over Judaism because I'm talking about all the Abrahamic religions have this problem. And as it turns out, all the Eastern ones do as well, or at least all the ones okay. that I've looked into. Um, so Moses, Abraham, Joshua, 
the whole Exodus story, the whole conquest of Canaan story, um, the everything up to um, David and Solomon, we can pretty much dispense with it all historically. Um, Evidence-wise, those things just did not happen. For the kingdoms of David, yeah, it looks like there was some kind of Jerusalem-based war chief type bandit king named David, um, but it's not a dead cert, and it's certainly true that he was not, we're not seeing the kingdom that uh, it's described in the Bible under David and Solomon. Um, Russell Gamerkin is a historian who's done an amazing job of talking about how the Old Testament the, that we think of, you know, Solomon, all this evidence is not coming to us until much later than even secular scholars have been saying. Um, it's very common to hear secular biblical historians say these stories came together in final form during the Persian period after the exile. And he makes a really compelling argument that no, it's even about 300 years after that around the year 270 BC in Alexandria, Egypt. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. There was someone in the comments that asked a question that um, it may be a bit general, but I feel like it's, it's a, a really good one. So if these folks did not exist, who, what, when, why, and how this, did the story start? Because someone had to make them up. That so. is an awesome question. And again, we can spend all night just talking about Christianity, and I have done. Um, but basically, and this kind of gets into what I was going to do originally uh, as a talk, talking about the different stages that religions go to uh, through, whether we're talking about Eastern religions or Western religions. Um, what it seems to happen in the case of Christianity is that the, this movement was started out as a as a small uh, series of movements, different 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 groups of Jewish uh, believers that wanted to make a Jewish form of the mystery mystery faiths, um, and there was a new um, messianic anticipation that was expected in the early part of the first century, and so there were lots of Jews who expected either a messiah who was going to kick out the, the romans and all their enemies or something like that you know because they knew there was going to be something so no matter what had happened in the first century there was a group of jews who said yep that we called it we were saying that all along and but you've got you've got these these gnostic groups you've got these proto-christian groups you've got all these messianic jews and one of them a guy that we call Mark, though that wasn't his real name, writes this allegory in after the fall with Rome, uh, sorry, the fall of Jerusalem to Rome, trying to explain why the Savior didn't come, even though we expected him generations ago. Um, this fact, sounds very modern day too, like a lot of the the 19th century religions, like um, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh Day Adventists. It sounds very like like we're we're waiting for this messiah to come and there's yeah. these are the prophecies and um then they don't get fulfilled and they kind of uh okay so that's something similar happened in the case of christianity i mean it's interesting it, it would be fun to do like a side-by-side -side comparison of any given ones because for instance mormonism um and i'm doing a podcast series right now on myth vision with uh derek lambert and uh, bryce blankenagle and uh, it was meant to be an eight-part series, maybe a 10-part series. And I think we just wrapped episode 25, 26 now. Uh, <laughs> that sounds uh, like RFRX. Basically, the secret <laughs> history of Mormonism. And if anybody's interested in that, I, I you know, in all modesty, you got to watch it. It's really amazing. Because uh, even Mormons have no idea some of the stuff that went on uh, behind the scenes in their own religion. And heathens like us we just eat this stuff like up like popcorn it's just so mind-blowing um and uh when you talk about you know l ron hubbard when you talk about uh mormons when you talk about uh christian science i think there's a level of chicanery and and dishonesty about them uh, that you can say that i don't think was necessarily there 
in the beginning of a religion mm. like um, uh, Judaism or Christianity, um, they they were writing allegories. They weren't writing. Um, they weren't f- setting out to write a fake religion. Okay. They were doing what all these mystery faiths did. They'd write a good story about Mithra killing the bull of Taurus and all their stories are simple. They're fun. They're kicky. And they've got all these allegorical elements in it. Um, um, you've story, used that word a few times. Would you, elements from start to finish. Would, would you mind kind of quickly um, explaining allegory and how that's different yeah. than like a metaphor or a fable or something like that or similar? Yeah. Um, so Mark, the guy we call Mark, not his real name, um, set out to write what he w- did. <clears throat> it's uh, very like a Jewish custom, uh, sorry, a Jewish custom called Midrash, where you take an old story from the, the Old Testament and you, you update it. It's like when they took Romeo and Juliet and turned it into West Side Story. The plot's the same, the themes are the same, and yet they've given this fresh new look, you know. Um, and that we see that throughout Jewish history and throughout early Christian history, that they, the writers are doing this uh, uh, to make, to, to, they did it, there was like a split level effect um, in the mystery face. They would write these myths and then the common people who didn't really understand the deeper meanings would just think it's a good story. And, you know, Jesus went to the well and there was a woman in adultery, you know, and they, and they spread the stories like that. But um, the, they expected their educated, theologically savvy readers to say, Oh, he's really talking about morality. Okay. So it's, it's like a, a... he's really talking about astrology, about these theological concepts. Um, So it's kind of a, like a story with, multiple layers to it like it can be entertaining but it also can be um uh educational or theo- theological in, in um nature exactly i want to talk about what christianity looked like before mark did that um when we look at christianity before the gospels and christianity after the gospels they're two completely different animals at least two um when we're talking about like Paul's uh, era, Paul is preaching a, a Jesus that's very different from what we get in the Gospels. And he talks about Jesus very differently than we talk about Jesus. So before the Gospels are written, all Christians all talk about Jesus in a very different way. And stop me if you lose me at all. Um, but their, God, their Jesus is not somebody who was around on earth recently. He's somebody who's a mystery that they've only learned about from personal revelation and from their study of the scriptures. And that everything they know about what he did comes from as it was according to the scriptures. We know he was dead for three days and then arose again according to the scripture. Uh, is an allegory. Everything he did was off camera in a, the celestial heavens and one day he'll come, and then that'll be the end of the world. Paul talks a lot about Jesus coming, never says anything about Jesus coming back, never says anything about it being a second coming. But he says, yeah, there's no time to get married, nothing. Jesus is coming, and that'll be the end of everything when that happens. It sounds like the Jesus of the Gospels was a real person, and the Jesus of the post gospels was a spiritual being. Pre gospels, but yes. Well, yes. oh, the pre gospels was a spiritual being. Yeah. So, for instance, the earliest Christians and preachers like Paul and whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, they're talking about a very different Jesus than the Jesus of the gospels. Um, they're talking about someone who's been a secret in heaven all this time and that he's now on earth because he's now being preached by people like Paul who by their own admission, never saw Jesus. Um, and they keep saying things like, oh, Jesus is coming. The Lord is coming. He will be coming. And they describe him just like they're describing a savior deity from these mystery faiths. Got it. Is that why people like Jordan Peterson kind of pick up on the more spiritual, metaphorical versions of uh, Jesus? Or is that like a completely different thing? 
Because well, uh, I know he has his own, you know, right. story about it, but yeah. Um, it's interesting because theologians, and uh, I know David Madison could talk about this much more eloquently than I uh, can. And if you have seen his book, 10 Tough uh, Problems in Christian Thought and Belief, that's a must read. Um, but basically theologians tend to go off on these tangents that the rank and file members of the flock never get to. Uh, and so they have these very esoteric, very amorphous depictions of what God is. Uh, and they just sort of spin off into some, you know, this out in the ozone somewhere with their own ideas of who Christ was that makes sense to them, you know. Um, and if they have to trouble themselves to read the Old Testament and see that icky, gross Old Testament God, that's kind of gross. But they have a beautiful Christ-like, you know, this, that's the old thing. The new thing is all better. Um, it's, it's fascinating to watch the, the mental gymnastics that they go through to tell us that, you know, God is really wonderful and not horrible and very, very real. Unless he's something not real, but grounded in reality, or he's the, the, the essence of it. And, you know, the, the, the language that they use just gets more vaporous and vaporous the more they, they go on about it. Yeah, okay. it makes you wonder what is a Christian? Like, what do you need to believe in to be a Christian? Like, do you need to believe in the literal res resurrection of uh, Jesus? Or is it just that you need to believe in the concept of Jesus and as a godlike figure? Is there are even early church fathers who are basically admitting that. Uh, like Origen, he says, now, if you read the scriptures literally, they're crazy and make no sense. And he, he's, he says almost exactly those words. But you have to interpret it mystically and spiritually, he says. And um, they give examples like uh, uh, the boat, the, the, the crossing the stormy sea of Galilee uh, when Jesus walks on the water. And it's like they have all these reasons why that story could never happen as it's written. And yet they said, but it's beautiful because this represents the Christian life. This represents our Torah and blah, blah, blah. And it's all allegorical. It's down the line. It's allegorical. And they act as though the fact that it never could have happened, that's not consequential at all. The beautiful spiritual method, message is what's important. So there comes a point where some theologians out there, I don't even know what they're thinking. Uh, it's like, you know, is this all just an intellectual exercise for you? So then we have some other religious leaders we kind of were talking about a while ago, and it seemed to fit a similar pattern. Um, who do we want to move on to next? I mean, we could just just kind of touch bases on, on Islam, for example. Um, the first complete biography of Muhammad doesn't appear for at least 125 years after his death. Um, 60 years after his death, we have caliphs saying um, that, oh, this things that we think of as common practices like reciting from the Quran, um, they begin and they're saying, they make claims to have collected the Quran and distributed the Quran, even though official church history has that happening 40 years earlier. Evidence outside of Islam from like the, the states that were conquered by the Arabs, um, make it really clear that yeah, the Arabian conquest happened, but the Quran and Islam was not the cause of those conquests. It was the result of those conquests. They created a new religion to have the political theology that the Christians had and the Jews had. Oh, yeah. so they were trying to keep up with the Johnsons or something like that. Right, and it looks like... Um, um, that early Islam started out as a snuff from Jewish Christians in, in the East, in that area. Um, and it was originally something a lot more, um, well, for instance, just for, for instance, the word Muhammad uh, is not just a name, it's also a title. It means the praised one or the chosen one. Um, and there are um, the early depictions uh, like for coins and inscriptions that have Muhammad, but they have him holding a cross. Um, there's oh. of him working with the Jews and th there's verses in the Quran about the people of the books, the Jews and the Christians. 
Christians, they're kind of special. Um, they're, they're, they're one of us. We're all pals, you know, and it looks like early Islam was a movement that came out of this and was originally much more positive to both of them. Um, I've, I've seen that done a lot in different uh, types of religions where they would sort of um, use some of the local traditions uh, and absorb it into kind of like the grander religion just to make, I don't know, to maybe make the conquered people uh, exactly not revolt, not to rise up. Christianity sure did it. I mean, mm-hmm. and you go to Mexico, all of those Aztec temples get knocked down and you slap a... Uh, Christian church in its place, just like they did in Ireland, just like they did in, in Scandinavia, um, just like they did in Rome. They're all built on top of the older uh, uh, pagan uh, sites. Um, there were Christian fathers who were talking about how, isn't it amazing that the cave where Jesus was supposed to have been born, the manger, um, was a, a shrine to Adonis. It's like, yeah, what are the odds of that? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So uh, it sounds like Islam had a similar pattern um, when they were uh, going around conquering. And it's funny, the, even the name Muslim doesn't start appearing until generations after Muslims are supposed to have been around. Um, but there's a great, there's a, been several great books actually. Ibn Warwick and um, Robert Spencer have written books on books uh, on in search of the historical Muhammad and did Muhammad exist? And uh, it really blew my mind to see that. And uh, like I said, Buddha, that was surprising, but Muhammad blew my mind. Yeah. Not only because I just assumed he was, had abundant evidence to back him up, which he doesn't, but that the timing and the process that it happened felt so much like where we got. Yeah. I, I, I can see a pattern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, the funny thing was in getting ready for this talk, uh, I was talking to a friend who was a Sikh and I was saying, yeah, this is weird. It seems like whether you're talking about Eastern religion or Western religion, you see these same patterns of it starts as a once upon a time story right from the beginning. There's mm-hmm. no eyewitnesses. There's no um, people who were there on the ground. It's all coming to a second hand. And he said something effective. Yeah. Sikh isn't like, isn't like that. It was, it was only started, you know, 500 years ago. So it didn't have time for that. And I'm thinking, oh, that's really interesting. And then I start looking into it. It has exactly that pattern. Wow. Dude, dude, wow. I don't know how to tell you this, but the 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 first guru who started uh, is uh, Sikhism. We don't get his scriptures until the fifth uh, guru of of Sikhism. Um, oh wow! You know, it, uh, over a uh, hundred years or about sixty years. Sorry, um, and. And in the meantime, all the stories of that first guru, they grew up, um, the, what they're called the, the Jenna Sakis, um, none of them have historical value to them. They all contradict each other. And they have things like him talking to a fish and having conversation with it. That, that, this kind of level of mythical whatnot. Um, and one thing that all, also all religions seem to have in common is that they get very angry when you start examining the scriptures of their religion. If you try to study the texts, the hostility and the resistance snaps just like that. Um, just like Islam, just like Christianity, just like Judaism, just like Sikhs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's funny, the Buddhists seem to be the most cool with the thought that there might not have been a Buddha. <laughs> And it's, it's so Zen of them to say, yeah, it's, it's so like, meta. <laughs> it's like this. If you need a Buddha, there's a Buddha for you. If you don't need a Buddha, eh, there's no Buddha. <laughs> What's the problem? <laughs> so I always understood, I always understood that Buddha was like the son of a wealthy man. And he yes. kind of just threw off the trappings and wanted to become a common man. And then all of a sudden, one day he sat underneath the a lotus tree and uh, had, um, had this realization exactly and the funny thing about him is that a lot of the stuff from his story sounds just like the biography of the founder maravira of jainism the ancient religion of jainism so so did so jainism was was before buddhism is that correct uh to be honest i'm not sure who started first but they're both their stories are very similar um 
uh, of, in their biography. Okay. And uh, so who was the main um, uh, leader of Jainism again? Can you say uh, that? Mara, Mara, sorry, Mahavira. Mahavira, Mahavira okay. Yeah. Um, worth looking up. And so uh, the two, the, both Buddha and Mahavira had similar backstories. Very uh, similar stories. Um, the story of, of Taoism, the founder of Taoism, Lao Tzu, um, there's virtually nothing factual we know about his existence and uh, e even, even the name himself, um, even though he's supposed to be written in the sixth or fifth century BC, um, it looks like, like Solomon, like uh, Aesop, uh, that they are collections of uh, stories, of wisdom, thing, that are from different people over hundreds of years or at least decades at the very least. And, and, and collected under one name. Um, and that was another thing that surprised me too, that it's not just religious figures, but figures like Homer, uh, the prophet Isaiah, um, Aesop. Um, these are the same kind of things where they become like a placeholder for wisdom or a placeholder for folksy tales about animals and things like that. Um, You're not talking about Homer Simpson, right? No, <laughs> sorry. Because that's a bunch of collection of stories right there that oh, all well. come from different. <laughs> well, it's interesting because they actually wrote ancient biographies about him. Um, and yet he's a completely mythical person. The founder of Rome, the, the mythical founder of Rome, Romulus, same deal. He was supposed to have been a twin. He was the godly twin of the earthly, uh, sorry, the godly twin. His brother was the earthly one. Um, and... Uh, yeah. So are, are you saying that um, the Iliad and the Odyssey are just kind of a collection of stories just sort of put together one after another? Is... There's definitely layers that come um, after to, to a point that they realize won't, no single one person wrote this because like in one part oh, of the book, wow. they're, wearing, no they're using bronze. In another part, they're using, you know, oh. that kind of thing. It's, uh, there's anachronisms in there. Um, well, I mean, there's sirens, and they didn't have those until well, the I mean, 20th yeah, century or something like that. I mean, the, uh, just the mythical elements aside, there's just historical yeah. uh, fragments that, that say, oh, okay, clearly the same guy did not write both these passages. Huh. I had no idea. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, Interesting. Fun fact. Oh, I was going to say, right now. Sorry, working, David. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm working on a book, Sex and Violence in the Bible, and that has been super fun. And one of the things I've been looking into that is just how the Old Testament came together. And man, um, if I thought the New Testament was in trouble, boy, the Old Testament was just crazy buckets in trouble. It's just amazing that what a, what a, a cluster that jungle is. Um, so I was wondering, because you have been speaking about um, how different writings contradict each other. I'm wondering if there is any archaeological evidence of that this proves some sort of event that maybe is claimed in the Bible, in Islam, yeah. in other religions. Yeah, and I mentioned just very briefly for Islam that um, like inscriptions and coins don't start appearing until generations later. Um, and we, on the flip side, we do have historical records that talk about things that are different from the from the historical from the traditional picture of Islam. So it's not just an absence of evidence, but it's evidence over here that makes no sense if the story was true. Um, as far as the Old Testament goes, um, I was talking about how the Exodus never happened. The conquest of Canaan never happened. And uh, there's a great book called The Bible Unearthed by Israel Finkelstein and Neil Silberman, two Tel Aviv archaeologists. And they've done an amazing job of just talking about how the archaeological opinion has changed on the New Testament, and or sorry, the Old Testament rather, um, from the time of the 50s when they're saying, oh, the Bible is history and it confirms the Bible, yay. And it's like, no, it really doesn't. And, and how it's like, yeah, you've got Moses writing these things down before writing was invented, you know, it's, and uh, you've got David as a king before there was any kingdom at all. We have no archaeological evidence for it, and we have abundant archaeological evidence for other things. Um, the biggest surprise for most Christians is to find out just how many gods and goddesses were being worshipped by the Jews long after uh, 
you would think that they had uh, uh, all gone over to Yahweh. That was definitely a late addition. Um, a slight spoiler alert. In the book, I talk about this thing called the Elephantine Papyri. Which um, book are you referring uh, to? In, in the Sex and Violence in the Bible book, I want to talk okay. about this thing called the Elephantine Papyri because this has bugged me for a long time. Um, it's this 5th century BC group of Jews. It's a colony in Egypt, in, in southern Egypt. Um, they have their own temple. They're Jews. Uh, they're mercenaries for, for Egypt. And they're in close uh, con contact with the temple in Jerusalem. And we have a hundred years of correspondence from this colony of Jews in the fifth century BC. And they don't seem to know anything about Moses. They don't know, seem to know anything about Passover, or, um, all these different things. And they have, they worship three gods in their temple, <laughs> including a goddess and they're not some weird heretical spinoff. They're on good terms with the temple in Jerusalem. And, and this um, is 5th century BC. Fifth like 5th century, yeah. Wow. And they had no idea about, wow. Yeah. But and they were in Egypt and they had no idea about Moses. I mean, the whole right. exodus is supposed to take place in Egypt. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And again, Russell Gamerkin is what blew my mind with that. Uh, last May, he threw a monkey wrench into my whole structure of this book because it's like yeah it looks like that story doesn't get finalized or even created until wow that's that's amazing yeah. that's mind-blowing mind oh my gosh yeah yeah um do we have yeah, any no, first, our, our first five books of the bible are not our oldest part of the bible by any stretch it's sure. one of the later parts what about for some of the other religious traditions? Do we have any archaeological evidence for um, those folks at all? Long story short, I don't have archaeological evidence. All right. <laughs> most, of, most of the stuff I have on them is textual. Yeah. Now, I've always been quite curious how so many people just believe like the textual evidence as if it's not just someone writing something on a piece of paper. Yeah. Like... You know, like someone could read Lord of the Rings in a few hundred years and be like, yep, that's my new religion. You know, like what's, I don't know, I just, I just don't understand. <laughs> yeah. And it's funny to me because you see Christians getting in all these big arguments when, when there's like contradicting things about what the Bible says. And at the end of the day, even though there's contradictions in what it says, it's like, that doesn't mean any one of these is the one true one. It just means, yeah, there are yeah. more lies on top of more lies, myths upon myths. It, it, the, the, the act is of the claim is the proof. Yeah. Speaking of archaeological evidence, like the, 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 one of the things that I hear is from a lot of people, a lot of believers that the Bible is real is like, look, it talks about Judah in the Bible. There's Judah. It talks about the so-and-so in the Bible. There's this, we found this and um, kind of, and one of the um, uh, things that are, is kind of used to make sense of that is, well, those are stories that are taking place, like fictional stories that are taking place, and those may be fictional stories that are taking place in real places, like Spider-Man was in New York. Uh, <laughs> exactly. type but of it's thing. even worse than that, because in the case of the Old Testament, the archaeologists would say, hey, look, we found this ruin over here. Why that must be Beersheba, because it says right here in the Bible. So it's incredibly oh, circular. They're and, backfilling uh, it. Yeah. And okay. it's also funny is they started finding the records of other non-Jewish groups like the Elamites and uh, um, and Ugarit and all the and Mesopotamia and Babylonian. When we get the Egyptian records of these things in the Bible, it's like Oh wait a second! <laughs> they don't say anything about this. They they say they tell us very different story. Um, that's that's really cool. I mean, it sounds like so many different types of experts and so many different types of fields have to come together to compare all of this stuff. Um, and there's just so many different languages that things have to get translated out of. Um, and, and, and context and it's and yeah it's it's fascinating it's amazing wow. and it, it involves sociology it involves linguistics it involves history archaeology textual evidence archaeological evidence uh, yeah. yeah i mean you're you're meant uh, and i've heard many others and, and you kind of mentioned like 
how this book is written, some of the specific words that are used. And to me, that kind of just like goes right over my head. When I, uh, I and maybe just from my own upbringing, when I read the Bible, I it's so hard for me to get past or to not like look really carefully at how the words are being used and um, uh, and all I kind of read are stories. Um, yeah. um, but it, it, I'm so grateful for folks like yourself and, and so many of the other experts who are able to look at it much more critically than I can. And, and I'm, I appreciate you saying that. And I feel like I am just the middleman um, I, I call myself a combat reporter from the, the, the culture war about this um, because I'm not, I mean, I have a degree in history, but I'm not a historian. I'm not an academic. I don't have a PhD, but these aren't my ideas and these aren't my opinions. Right. I'm just reporting what it is and I'm trying to make it as accessible as I possibly can. Um, and it's so funny to read some of the most damning things are what you read from Christian sources uh, and reference books. I'll, for example, I, I remember reading about uh, the book of Acts, which is supposed to be like the, the history of the early church. Mm -hmm. And the guy who's in the standard reference book talking about Acts says, now, the book of Acts lends itself very poorly to the historian, but it's a rich treasure trove <laughs> to the theologian. I'm like, whoa, 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 back up. what did you just say? What wow. did you say? And uh Kind of gave the game away at that point. The theologians, like, do they really believe this or is their God something else over there? It's like, guys, how do you, how do you sleep at night? Honestly. <laughs> and yeah. I can't tell you how many times you'll see them say something that's like, oh, jaw dropping. And then they quickly touch base and go, oh, but of course there was a real Jesus, blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> this weird thing over here that I just said, boom. I was just going to ask, with so many different contradictions, um, how do scholars get an agreement? Like, is there a, a method for it? Is there, is there even an agreement? You know, is there like a, because I guess most of them do believe that Jesus exists, but, but it doesn't seem like the evidence points that way. So. It's funny, because that's where I get from atheists a lot. They say, oh, well, there's a huge consensus that there was a Jesus. And it's like, yeah, funny thing about that consensus, it's like, First of all, there's not a huge consensus about Jesus because if you take all the secular scholars and all the various religious scholars, boom, already they're talking about two different Jesuses, the Jesus of faith and the Jesus of history. And those are two completely different animals. And that's just placeholders for all this whole family trees of Jesuses, the real Jesus and the, mm. the Jesus of faith. Um, and scholars don't agree about who Jesus was or what he was, um, you know, it depends how much they take it, what he says in the Bible at face value. Um, and you can't because for one thing, um, they contradict each other on massively basic things, fundamental things, not just, oh, eyewitness testimony, you know, Jesus is wearing a blue shirt. No, it was a red shirt. No, no, that's not it. It's like mm. the gospel of John is clearly taking their stories and then inverting it, switching it, putting in a new character here, um, getting Jesus in trouble for completely different reasons that don't even appear in the other gospels. Um, and I've got four books talking about that, so I don't need to <laughs> <laughs> wrap up that, go down that rabbit hole. But yeah, it's it's astounding to me. This, is, this has been incredibly enlightening for me. Um, I, I've been, you know, I, I kind of, I was excited about this, but it exceeded my expectations of this discussion. Thank you so much, David. Um, right. Before before we move on to the Q&A, do you have anything else that um, uh, you wanted to cover that we didn't talk about? Well, I guess I would just say at the end of the day, I mean, it doesn't matter to me if these guys are real or not. I don't have a dog in the hunt. If there was a real Muhammad, if there was a real Buddha, the real Jesus, fair play. It doesn't mean these religions make sense anymore it's not all of a sudden oh there really was to jesus i guess it's all true no that's not true uh and the but the fact that i keep harping on the fact that these are mythical figures is because that's what it looks like to me and the deeper i go and checking in the research of other people far more qualified than me who've come to the same conclusion it seems that that is the case all the way across the board um, and the exceptions are people that we know, like L. Ron Hubbard and Joseph Smith, unless you count the 
Prophet Moroni as the real founder of the church. <laughs> he's completely mental too. Um, but, uh, and it yeah. sounds like um, whether the, the, the founder or the leader of the church is mythical or not, people are still going to um, believe uh, what, what they want to believe. And um, more often than not, I hear f folks say when I have conversations about this kind of stuff that um, it all comes down to faith. You just have to have faith in it. And yeah. But when you're talking about somebody else's religion, it's somehow easier for Christians to accept that or for Muslims to accept that Christians are, mm -hmm. well, maybe not so much there because that's a little close to the family. But <laughs> when you see another religion and you see how shaky the evidence is, that's easy for most believers to see the, the fly, the uh, log in the, was it the speck in their eye <laughs> and not the log in their own. Mm -hmm. Well, David, thank you so much. Um, we have got uh, quite a few questions. Um, Amaya, do you want to start us off with some questions? Okay, the first question is, how do you deal with the word faith? Um, which is a bit of a general one, so I'm not sure exactly what that means. But um, yeah, just like how do you, I guess, how do you approach the word faith or how do you understand it? Or what do you do when someone speaks about faith? Because it's essentially an unevidenced. Sure, and maybe they can do a follow-up question if, we're, if, not, if I'm not getting it right, but usually when somebody brings up the faith card to me, um, it's like, well, everybody's got faith in something, and if you've got your, you've got your faith in your book, what, where does that faith come from? What, what is it based on? Is it based on evidence? Is it based on your feelings? Because here's a Muslim over here, here's a Mormon over here, here's a Catholic over here. They all have faith in their things, and it's just as real to them. Mm -hmm. um, then another person was asking if there's no consensus on Jesus um, yeah I guess how, how have historians managed to agree on a consensus on other gods if they have at all because I was under the impression that there was a consensus for Jesus but maybe now you're surprising me to tell me that well, there is no consensus in other gods either <laughs> <laughs> well and this is the thing it's like until I started doing research for this talk I assumed there was consensus on Sikhism I assumed there was consensus you know, uh, on all these things. Uh, it's when you start looking at it and kicking the tires, you find out, oh, this consensus isn't as strong as I thought. Um, funny thing about that too, is <clears throat> what consensus there is on the secular side, for the most part, mythicists like me agree with them. The, the <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> with things like Mark and priority, that Mark was the first gospel, we agree with that. There's a thing called the synoptic problem, which, really is, should be called the synoptic in that an interesting situation because it's it's not a problem unless you think that the gospel should all be in agreement with each other. Um, what the synoptic problem is, is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all seem to be copied from Mark. Um, and Matthew and Luke, who, well, uh, Matthew was supposedly an eyewitness to Jesus, you know, um, mm -hmm. is copying Mark, a non-eyewitness to Jesus and expanding on his story. Uh, and then John's coming later and he's putting in his own spin and doesn't even care to match up the other guys so much. Um, things like that, we're all in agreement about. We just take our conclusion a little further. Um, and the funny thing is a lot of atheists are still really cheesed off about mythicism, though not as much as they were in 2010 when I wrote Nailed. When Jesus Mything in Action came out, uh, I would get people, oh, no, I always thought Jesus was fake. It's like, well, where were you seven <laughs> years ago when I wrote my book? And, you know, that's crap for it. But here's the funny thing. Whether at the end of the day it turns out that the mythicists are right or whether it turns out that, yeah, there was a Jesus, either way, the Jesus of faith that we, they talk about on the other side, he gets debunked no matter which of us comes out on top. And in the meantime, everything we hear in the debate from the guys who insist that there was a Jesus and the guys who insist, no, it, there probably wasn't, everything we learn about Jesus in that process helps us better call the bluff of anyone who tells us, oh, I know what Jesus said and what he thought and how he wants you to behave and how he wants you to vote. Then that alone is what uh, is worth having the discussion about Jesus and Muhammad and Buddha and Moses and Abraham all along down the line. Got it. Uh, we have another question here. Um, uh, this person understands that there were multiple messiahs at the time of Jesus. And I kind of remember seeing something like that in the documentary Life of Brian, um, <laughs> yes. where there was just messiahs all over the place. 
But yeah, we have evidence for at, over a dozen messiahs at the time who weren't halfway as interesting as Jesus is in the gospel. And yet every single one of those guys did something Jesus couldn't do. And that was get a dent in the historical record. Um, mm. We don't have anything outside of Jesus. Uh, I was going to say cult, but outside of the Jesus movement for the better part of a hundred years. So it's not even like the Jews were covering it up. It's like, no, they didn't. They had never heard these stories. Um, Mark ends his gospel the way it does to provide an out. And that's why you've never heard this story is because the silly women ran away from the tomb and they told no one. That's where his gospel originally ended in the oldest form of it. So someone else asks, were the early Christian sects not Trinitarian? Probably pronouncing that wrong. But... No, you're right. Trinitarian. Did they believe in the Trinity? Yeah, and exactly. Absolutely no, they did not. That idea took centuries to develop. Centuries to develop. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it's funny, there's the verses, there's real, there's no verse that says anything about the Trinity in the gospel. And the verses that even seem to link Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, those aren't even original. And they're not, those aren't explicitly saying there was a Trinity, that these are all one God. Uh, but those aren't original either. We have got one final question, and it's about um, proto Hebrew texts. Um, uh, is there any, can you tell us about that? And, and um, is there any proof that they actually existed? Like, um, before you go, one of the things that I'm thinking about is uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh and kind of how that turned into Noah's flood, perhaps. Right. Um, it, well, that's kind of two different questions, but I'll go with oh, that. Okay. Um, we've got, we have interesting evidence <clears throat> for Babylonian ideas, for Ugarit ideas, um, and um, and Canaanite ideas um, that all came part were part of our gods, our Yahweh's family tree, basically. Um, <clears throat> so we do have we do have evidence that, for instance, uh, and this is in the Bible too. But uh, when when Moses meets God at the burning bush for the first time, he says, "Oh yeah, back in those days, I didn't use my name Yahweh. I used my name El, who happens to be the head of the Canaanite." pantheon oh really and, and all there's so many verses in the the in our psalms and in the old testament where god is praised for doing these things or this particular fighting this particular monster uh defeating this particular this and and it's all ways that were used to describe baal who in the bible is is yahweh's big enemy but it seems like yahweh sure has an awful lot in common with baal um, to the point that maybe Yahweh and Baal were the same thing until he got separated out. And we can spend all day just talking about that process for sure. For sure. So is, you're telling it from when Moses at the burning bush, he talks about, or he says, I used to be so-and-so. And it yeah. sounds like, like the thing that immediately came to my mind was the, exactly what we had talked about when another uh, religion sort of comes in and takes over an area and just softens the the blow a little bit. Yep, and yeah. and we see this with other religions too in the ancient world, where they they take over people and instead of wiping out their religion, they absorb their religion. They bring it in. And Alexander the Great was huge for this. And in fact, that's where the mystery faiths came from. Is that he was trying to instead of building a new pantheon, he was building like a super pantheon. Um, and, and it turned into a completely different religious movement altogether. I read a book, um, uh, Noah Before the Flood, or the the Flood yeah. Before, or something like that, by Irving Finkel, and he talked. He said uh, what I heard about, or what I read about, is that when the Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians. Oh gosh, I'd probably not the Babylonians. Yeah, yeah. Babylonian exile. Yeah. They they took them, they took a bunch of the religious leaders to Babylon. Yeah. And it seems like many of the religious uh, writings that were done at that time sort of absorbed what um the beliefs that the Babylonians had at the time. Absolutely, they did. Absolutely they did. Um paradise is a Persian word. It's not even a Hebrew word. So when Jesus says, Today you'll be with me in paradise, he's using that word um the ancient israelites before the before the roman era before the greek era they didn't believe in heaven or hell they believed in sheol 
and everybody went there after you died. It's this big gloomy underground cave. And the idea that there was, nope, there's a heaven for good people and a hell for good people, that came from the Babylonians, from Zoroastrianism. Um, hmm. The idea there was going to be end of the world. Um, the idea that demons, invisible demons cause sickness and can possess people, that came from Zoroastrianism too. Um, well, it sounds like everything we've talked about is like nothing. all man-made. <laughs> Bingo. Bingo, yeah. Wow. And the fascinating thing is, it's amazing what a collaborative art project every single religion is. Oh my gosh. Oh, it's like a collage. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And, and we could even talk about, and I meant to talk about in a different version of this talk, starting with Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon and like just the, the, the environment they lived in and the things that made them think there were gods. Like your dream and your uncle Thag appears, so even though he's been dead for years. Or <laughs> lightning strikes a tree and bam, there's fire, you know, rainbows in the sky, clouds. You know, when we think of how amazed we are by the sky, yeah. think how amazing they were to see that and look and say, look, there's Baal the thunder god, there's Thor, there, I see him right there. Look, he's coming on the bridge, you know. All the amazing things that they, they saw in the sky and the stars, um, you know, these, these were the things that led to religions um, in these amazingly well-documented processes and stages um, all around the world for all, yeah. resulting in all kinds of different religions. Well, I'm kind of walking away from this with a, a, a new understanding and, and really kind of a new outlook on uh, both like deep time, like how long this took but also kind of how short this took uh in in some uh senses uh, sense too but it all like uh, i love your your the way you said it's a collaborative art project that just sounds so perfect to me i mean people theologians ever since albert schweitzer remarked that when people try to see who the real jesus was he always seems to turn up as a picture of them if it's a Marxist looking yeah. for Jesus, he seems like a very proletariat, pro proletariat Marxist. If it's a feminist, he's very pro-feminist. If he's anti-Semitic, he's very anti-Semitic. <laughs> um, and he's like the perfect mirror. And uh, yeah. Your God never disagrees with you. Your God never, yeah. I said it, God believes it, that settles it. <laughs> Well, thank you, David. Um, we're, uh, you're going to be able to stick around for the Hangout um, for a little bit, right? Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, that kind of wraps up our uh, discussion part, but um, we have some more things to talk about just a little bit. Amaya, you want to tell us what's coming up next week? Yes, so next week we're going to have Dave Warnock speaking about sin, the concept of sin and how it has affected so many people who um, have been involved in religion. So it's going to be a great one. I feel like it's one that is like a very obvious Sarifarex topic, but we just haven't covered it until now. So yeah, you should all join us next week. It's going to be amazing. Just a reminder that if you want to see any of our previous Sarifarex sessions, and all of course this one too, you can find them in our YouTube channel. If you want to send us an email with any sort of ideas for topics, ideas for speakers, any suggestions how to improve, any feedback, anything at all, you can send us an email to rfrx at recoveryfromreligion.org. So those are our poll questions, and I'll leave it up while we hear some closing thoughts from our executive director, Gail Jordan. Gail, how are you doing today? Fine, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. And uh, David, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I, I say this uh, so often, but I never fail to learn something in an RFRX. And this was fabulously informative. And it's so, you know, it's it, uh, we forget for us on this side, it's an academic discussion and it's uh, fun and it's exciting and we're picking it apart. If we could, um, under remember and understand that for those on the other side this is everything and so i you know i i'm struck by the difference in how we approach these kinds of discussion now and being on this side now this was just awesome being on the other side before it would have been devastating and extremely difficult and um significant so you know to as we keep that in mind we have we have, we had over 100 folks joining us tonight if you are somewhere along that spectrum of on the other side and you need to talk about this we have agents standing by to talk to you about it we also have a resources tab 
on recoveringfromreligion.org. I'm sure there are links to David's books, but more than that, um, you can, there's cross references there. You can explore this on your own time in your own place if you're a little bit put out because of the conversation that we had tonight. It's part of it. That's part of the process. And so please uh, follow up with that. And, and if you'd like to talk with, a, with, uh, with an agent, you can do that. And then an agent will ask you if you'd like to join the online community. And in there, you can talk to other folks about this very thing. So this, if this has uh, rattled your proverbial cage a little bit, please don't let it go. Pick it up. Talk about it. You may come out the other side and, and come to a place where you're comfortable with, with what you believe. And that's awesome. That's what we want you to do. Recovering from Religion is here to help you do that. If you would like to volunteer, we would love to have you join our family. If volunteering is not for you and you'd like to be part of our donor family, we'd like that too. All of these donor dollars go toward helping people recognize that we're here and providing these kinds of things, um, a platform and a, and a means to let folks know that we're here, we're ready, we're listening. Thank you, David, for an incredible presentation. That was just wonderful. We, um, I, I miss seeing you in person. Hopefully before too much longer, we'll get to see each other and give each other big hugs. Everybody, please stay and join the social hour. That's one of the most important parts of Recovering from Religion. Thank you again for attending, and we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.